Hey everyone, Raptor Chatter here, and we're going to be looking at what happened in April 2024 in paleontology. And there's a lot, so let's get started. So this first one isn't necessarily directly paleontology, but rather evolutionary biology. And that's because they mostly were using things like genetics to try and understand how different bird groups evolved into what they are today. And with that, they made a whole new phylogeny of birds, and there's a whole bunch of discussion on that and how different groups are related to one another. They tested 363 different genomes at 63,430 locations within those genomes, and it tracks pretty well with what we expected, with many different groups breaking off at different times. First the paleonaths, which are things like ostriches, then the gyo and sarins, ducks and chickens, and then your other more derived groups progressively. There's a whole lot of discussion about these different bird groups and how they're all related and what subgroups evolved out of them, and I'm not that much of a bird expert, so in that case I would rather have you guys just know that, hey, this paper's open access, you can go look at it and read it yourself, and that should hopefully help you understand how different bird groups evolved. Another paper with bird genetics, but this time using them to try and understand when these different groups started to diverge from one another, and with many of the same authors using probably the exact same data set, we're able to go, hey, birds, or at least most modern groups, seem to have diverged about 65 million years ago, which is right around the time of the impact, except more modern dating methods have actually pushed that impact back to about 66 million years ago. What this means is about a million years after that impact, birds and the rest of the environment were starting to recover, and the birds were able to go, hey, it's free real estate, and evolve into many different groups that were doing a lot of different things within their environments. On the subject of that diversification, we have great fossils of birds coming from the Eocene London clay about 10 million years after that diversification event, maybe a little bit more even. And this has been really useful because we found a lot of birds, including some new ones. Walton Eirasaur tendringensis is a new one, and it's the earliest known upuma form, or the hoopoos. From the London clay, there's also three of its close relatives in the rollers, a group of mostly African birds. These include things like Lapudavis and two species of Sepincoriasus. Pristine Avis is also a known genus, and the new one was found in the London clay. It was found to be very similar to trogons. This is really interesting though, because their closest relatives are the woodpeckers, and this organism was preserved with enough of a foot to be able to actually show parts of the toes actually starting to point backwards, the zygodactyl condition. This is also what we see in woodpeckers. So potentially this organism is one of the first woodpeckers, or at least stem woodpeckers. It may not have been doing the same thing of gripping onto the tree sideways and pecking its head into it, but it was potentially at least on the lineage that would lead to those kinds of birds. This is just one of many papers that have come out on birds from the London clay. There is a collector who is just kind of going out and collecting for fun and recognize bird fossils very well. And so now other researchers are going through that collection and finding all kinds of very neat things, including this. But before that, there were other bird groups that are now extinct, like the Bohan ornithids, which were a group of eantothornines or opposite birds, also extinct as a whole group. However, uh, these were really common in things like the J-hole biota, which means a lot of them were preserved really, really well. And from that, they were able to look at some of these fossils and try and figure out how they may have behaved differently. Bohyornis and Parabohyornis were most likely eating plants, while others, like Niklongus singuis, were raptorial, meaning it would be able to chase down prey. There were others that were probably more generalist, like Juornis, and there may have even been some fish eaters, like Pangornis. Overall, this suggests that the earliest eantothornines were pretty generalist, and then different specialties evolved off of that, rather than it being a specialist, and then other specialties evolving out of one already specialist animal. And that makes a lot of sense for what we would expect, and it also shows that these eantothornines weren't all just doing the same thing. They evolved rapidly into a lot of different niches, kind of like we see in modern birds today. Those fossils from the J-hole Lagerstadt have been really useful, but one of the important things about Lagerstadt is we don't necessarily have a single concise definition of one. It's, hey, look, the fossils are preserved really well. And in scientific literature, that's great, but also we can't really make direct comparisons based just on, hey, look, it's a really pretty fossil. This paper essentially tried to address that. It went, okay, here's a more concise definition of what goes into being a Lagerstadt and the data that we need so we can start making those comparisons. Some of them are really obvious, like, hey, what animals are here? You obviously can't do comparisons on what kind of ecosystem it would have been without what the animals would have been, and even plants and fungi on top of that. There's also the biogeographic data that they suggest looking at, because not every fossil is going to perfectly show up right where you want it or exactly in the same spot it is today as it was 60 million years ago or so. For example, you can look at the Burgess Shale, one of the first Lagerstadt. 
and it would have been equatorial, and now it's in Canada, which is absolutely not near the equator. So just examples of that and where they would have lined up compared to other Vlogstadt at a similar time. They also discuss going into how the fossils are preserved, what is the taphonomy of these different sites. For example, sometimes they're just kind of carbonaceous films that are on the rock, and they can show a lot of detail, but they're also very fragile. Other times they can be preserved entirely as pyrite or fool's gold, which is also very interesting. And then there's the specific geology. What is the overall environment like? For example, we can look at the Solnhofen limestone with things like Archaeopteryx and go, hey, this is a lagoon system. There's a lot of small islands around, and there's these barrier reefs that form lagoons that would have become really salty, and that would also affect mineralization and how the fossils are actually preserved. A new paper on one of the Eocene Lagerstadt coming from Germany starts to actually look at some of this, and that's specifically because it was looking at how certain frogs were preserved and how the soft tissue was preserved. What it found is that there was actually some decay. Normally when we think of things like logger shot, we think there's no oxygen in the system and the fossils can't actually decay, or at least the bodies can't decay, because there's just not oxygen for the bacteria to survive on. It also goes on to show that this process was cut short, meaning some of the collagen fibers in these animals' skin would have still been preserved. And then calcium and phosphate in the ecosystem and from the bones of the organism would have been leached out and then remineralized into where those collagen fibers were. And so that's how we're able to get some of this soft tissue preservation from some of these frogs. But of course, it's also really important to see what these animals were and if we can find out new information from them. And that's what happened with new fossils of Tychotis coming from a Lagerstadt in Mexico. Tychotis is a fairly famous shark, and that's mostly because its teeth are moderately common and also very strange. It had these large dental batteries, meaning essentially whatever it was doing, it was crushing its prey. But other than occasional dental batteries, we basically had no idea what it looked like, other than maybe it could get up to very large sizes, like 30 feet long or around 10 meters. These new fossils, though, from Mexico helped to show it was not just hanging around the bottom. Instead, it was much more like a great white shark that ate hard-shelled things, and that makes sense when you're thinking about the ecosystems during the Cretaceous. There's a ton of ammonites, and also sea turtles are starting to move into the water. So seemingly it was a relatively fast moving shark that would have lived out in the water column and eaten hard prey. But also if it could catch a fish, it probably would have eaten that too. Really importantly though, it's showing just how unique some of these organisms were. We don't see large durophagus animals around today. Durophagy being eating very hard shelled things. So totally different ecosystem and sure enough, this animal was doing very well in it. The fossil also helps to show a little bit more of its morphology, with its head being much larger than the rest of the width of the body. So, really big head for crushing large prey, and then a more modest body. That said, while these fossils aren't pushing 30 feet, they do suggest based on some of the sizes of other teeth that have been found, it is likely that Tychotis could reach those kinds of sizes. Also in the oceans during the Mesozoic, you have the teleosaurs, which were ocean-going crocodilians, and within that group you have the machimosaurines, which were relatively large members of this group, with some of them approaching 10 meters in length. In general, these have been thought to have evolved only during the latest part of the Jurassic and then surviving into parts of the early Cretaceous. However, a new fossil coming from the middle Jurassic helps to show that no, they were around earlier. And it's actually really funny, I talked about this fossil previously, like just a month ago, when we were talking about a large ophthalmosaur coming from Switzerland. And it turns out that around that fossil, there were some teeth of crocodilians that were probably scavenging off of that carcass. And that includes what is the earliest known machimosaurine, meaning that they were already starting to evolve in the middle Jurassic, and it's just during the later Jurassic where they became more common. The Tethysuchians were also a group of crocodilians, and they had a lot of varied lives. Some were fully marine, while others were giant river monsters. And think of things like Sarcosuchus, one of these massive crocodilians that was potentially approaching 50 feet long, or around 18 meters. So, huge animals. But there were also a lot smaller ones, things like the Dryosaurines. The Dryosaurids are really interesting, because they're this group of not-modern crocodilians that actually did survive the KPG extinction. However, there was also another event that many of these organisms did survive and some didn't, and that's the second oceanic anoxic event, meaning essentially that oxygen levels in the oceans dropped super, super low. And that obviously is not great for life if there's not oxygen. So many groups died out during that time. There was a lot of turnover during this event, even within just the Tethysuchids. The Dryosaurids in particular took over a lot of environments where their relatives, the Fullosaurids, had previously lived. That said, they still weren't particularly numerous, at least until the KPG extinction, where suddenly they burst into diversity. And that's potentially just because 
so many of the other marine reptiles just died out. There's suddenly no more mosasaurs or plesiosaurs, and that means if you're a marine reptile that made it through that extinction and the oceans are starting to recover, again, it's free real estate, like with the birds. They could spread into those niches and start to become very successful. Now, again, obviously they did die out. I did say they're not a modern group, and that's not what this paper directly gets into. But it's just looking at how they did survive those two major events that really shaped their evolutionary history. As for amniotes that live in the water, and when I say amniote, that's all mammals and all reptiles, there's some really interesting trends that we do see, especially with their teeth. Specifically, what I'm talking about are apico-basal ridges, which are essentially these little grooves that run from the bottom of the tooth all the way up to the peak of the tooth. And we don't really know why these exist, but they're in basically every single large marine group of at least tetrapods. This means whales, this means plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, things like marine crocodilians, and even pinnipeds, so seals have these same kinds of grooves, and it's not known why. This paper tried using finite element analysis to understand why it might be the case though. And what that means is essentially they made models of these teeth and tried to see how they would handle different stress loads. And they're not even using necessarily perfectly accurate teeth. They made the base model and then added grooves to some of them. And that's a perfectly valid tactic for just testing the effect that those grooves would have on a very controlled specimen of just essentially a cone. What the paper found using these methods is basically nothing. We still don't know what these do. However, the main idea that I was testing is, hey, will this actually help distribute the load that these animals are biting with better? And that means no, which means they were probably for some other purpose. It could even be something as simple as there's some gene that triggers when an organism is living in the water that much, and that's what causes it to start developing these grooves. And that could just be for the hydration of the tooth or health of the tooth or something that's very hard to test. It's impossible to know for sure, at least right now, with these methods. But I'm sure more people are going to be testing this in the future, and hopefully we'll get an answer. Going back into the crocodilians, there were also some studies with those trying to get better mass estimates for all of Pseudosuchia, which is kind of the parent group to modern day crocodilians and includes a ton of diversity. What they were trying to answer is, can we get better mass estimates for these organisms? And that's because length only tells us so much. A 20 foot long Burmese python is going to weigh a lot less than a 20 foot long anaconda because they're fundamentally built differently. An anaconda is heavier bodied. And so what this paper did is that instead of just looking at the femur length and comparing that to the overall mass of alligators and comparing that to then fossil organisms that were related, what they instead did is they used the entire volume of the femur, which makes sense. Femur length is going to be a lot different if you're a crocodilian living on land like many did versus being more semi-aquatic like a modern day alligator. Now the data they did collect actually did support a few ideas that already existed. For example, dryosaurs being mostly semi-aquatic. And while well, yes, some of them did go into the water more, that makes sense. That's kind of what we thought about their life habits. However, you can also look at the Nodosuchians, a group of mostly land living crocodilians. What they found is based on the entire volume of their femurs, they actually would have weighed less than what we would expect based on the length alone. And that makes sense when you're looking at modern day crocodilians, especially alligators. Sure, they could walk around pretty well, but they're not spending all of their time doing that. They're not chasing down prey on land. Meanwhile, if you're thinking about things like some of these Nodosuchians, they were almost definitely doing that. And so a longer leg, even at a lighter size, is going to be an advantage there. Unfortunately for things like the Teleosaurs, it doesn't really answer much. And that makes sense when you look at their skeletons, because their hind limbs are very much reduced. So it doesn't necessarily help us right there. However, still a much better method for getting probably more accurate mass estimates for many of these extinct taxa and understanding what kind of energy requirements they might have needed and what kind of role they would have played in their environments. As for the Pseudosuchians, there was also a look at their bone growth, or at least a review on some of the work that's been done on them. They actually need a lot more of this done, as opposed to things like the dinosaurs where there's been plenty of work done on bone growth. And from that, we're estimating how old some of these dinosaurs were and how quickly they would have grown. This is all based on lines of arrested growth essentially yearly or likely yearly pauses in bone growth when there's just less resources available. What I found is that there is probably slower growth in the Pseudosuchians than some of these other groups, especially the dinosaurs. However, they also admit that there's not a ton of great data on this. And this is specifically because even large animals like Phasalosuchus, which could have been approaching 10 meters or 30 feet in length, really isn't that complete, and we don't actually have great data on it for its kind of growth stages. So what this means is there's a ton of data that we could gather that we just haven't yet. And fortunately, actually, the next paper talks a little bit about that coming from one site within just a single place.
The Ishigualasto Formation in Argentina is one of the best places for Triassic fossils, and that includes early dinosaurs, but also large pseudosuchians. What this paper found is actually there's some really interesting trends. Very few animals grew particularly slowly, and most of them at least matched modern-day animals' growth rates, including some very large pseudosuchian predators. However, some of those pseudosuchians and crocodilomorphs also grew much faster, meaning they were more comparable to many of the dinosaurs in the environment. What this means is it wasn't necessarily just, oh, hey, the crocodilians all grew slow, and the dinosaurs grew fast, and that's why they became successful. Instead, it seems like it was a much more kind of mixed environment as far as how quickly these animals were growing, and that that alone isn't the only reason that dinosaurs succeeded. Now, these aren't the only organisms that would have been around in the Triassic, and some of those groups actually started in the Permian, and that includes the Nectirolarids. This is a group of para-reptilians, meaning they're kind of like reptiles, their taxonomy is a little iffy. Check out my video on Scutosaurus if you want more on those. They're interesting. But regardless, this paper was the first one to actually CT scan a fossil from this group. Specifically, they CT scanned a Merrill letter. And this was able to show some of the different features that would have had in its skull. It also helps to show that it was closely related to the Pariasaurs, although much smaller than things like Scutosaurus. Spoilers for that video, but also there's a lot of other detail in there that's pretty interesting. As for other things that were happening in the Permian, you probably have tadpoles back there. Amphibians are kind of a pain in the butt because we don't really know where they evolved from that well. There's been some more evidence coming up and especially from places like Petrified Forest with the oldest known Sicilian and some of the oldest known frogs even. However, it's really important to understand that they're really weird for having their young be the way they are. We can look at other temnospondyls which are large amphibian-like organisms, and see that they have young that are more or less the same. Look at Apachysaurus, which is actually just Anachisma, but a small juvenile individual. This paper was essentially able to look at different fossils and track certain neonate characteristics, which are essentially juvenile characteristics in these different individuals, and from there trace the origins of some of these different traits that we see in modern-day amphibians. And from that, they were able to make this phylogeny and go, hey, yeah, it seems like they were really close to the dysarophoids, which is what many of these other papers have suggested, and really seems to be narrowing down our understanding on where it's likely that modern-day amphibians evolved from. As for other odd things in the Triassic this time, we're going to look at some Lagerpetids, and both of these are too incomplete to actually name, but they are different from one another, and that's really interesting because they both come from the same place in South America. These Brazilian fossils helped to show that there were Lagerpetids living alongside one another, and that they weren't necessarily all totally individual, like we'd normally find them. For example, in the Chinle Formation, there's basically just Dromomeron. There's not really much other good Lagerpetid material that we can say much for. So, really interesting to see that at least two of them did live alongside one another, and being so closely related to the pterosaurs, it does show that even those animals were able to split their niches and live alongside one another. So once the pterosaurs took flight and became even more different than the Lagerpetids, it makes sense that they were able to become successful. Palacridon is a genus of very early branching reptiles, branching as far back as the Permian. However, it lived in the Triassic, so it's just this long-lived lineage of early reptiles. The first specimens of this animal were actually found in Antarctica and in South Africa, and they seem to largely be the same species. Both of those come from early Triassic rocks. However, there another one was found in late Triassic rocks in Arizona. This is really interesting and kind of out of the blue. We didn't really expect to find another one that much later in the fossil record. However, this paper also CT scans some of these and we're able to go, hey, this one's really weird. The one from Arizona is pretty standard. It's missing some of these little ridges on the bottom of the teeth that we don't really know what they do. And in fact, the other ones do have those ridges and when compared with a ton of different fossils and living reptiles, there is nothing like it. So it's totally unique. It's very likely that these, since they don't really have an obvious purpose, were probably attached to ligaments that help to root the teeth into the jaw. And that makes sense that if there were ligaments, they would decay away, we wouldn't have those fossilized. But really interesting to see that this organism has this entirely new kind of structure. It also means that it needed a new name, or at least it got to keep its old name, and the one from Arizona needed a new name. So the older ones are Palacridon brown eye, and the new ones from Arizona are Palacridon parker eye, after Bill Parker, who's worked at Petrified Forest for years now, and is very knowledgeable about Triassic chinley rocks within that area. There's also a look at the Triassic Panchette Formation of India, and there's a few different archosaurs that have been described from there. The first is Anchistrodon indicus, and it's pretty partial, it's just a maxilla and two teeth, and there's been some more material found of it, and it's really hard to say that it's actually an 
its own genus. In fact, it seems pretty similar to one of the other animals described from there, Simsarasuchus, which is much more complete and is valid. So, realistically, there's just one of those, and they're Proterosuchids, an interesting group of archosaurs that were kind of doing their own thing for at least a while. And then you have Teratosaurus bengalensis, which, looking at it, it's even more partial. It's just a tooth, and also that tooth seems really similar to other Proterochampsids, especially those from South Africa and parts of China, which weren't close together, which means we really can't say that this animal was super unique. So it just seems like, yeah, with some sort of Proterosuchid, that's neat. We need better fossils of it. That's not to say that all of the fossils from the Triassic and Jurassic of India are terrible. In fact, there was a review of dinosaurs coming from the region. And what they found is the earliest of them, Alwalcaria, is actually one of the earliest known Saurischians. When you think about dinosaurs, you have the Ornithischians, the largely herbivorous ones, and then the Saurischians, which are things like the theropods and the sauropods. And it's hard to say which one of those groups it was closer to. It's very early in dinosaur evolution, so it may not have been that different from the origins and the first individuals of each of those groups. It comes from the bottom of the Malari Formation, and that's interesting because the upper part of the Malari Formation has been shown to have at least two different sauropodomorph clades living in it. So this really helps to highlight that India would have been kind of a bid bedrock for the very first sauropodomorphs and potentially even sauriscian evolution. This also makes sense when you're looking at where India was geographically in Pangaea. It would have been attached to parts of Africa, and we also know parts of Southern Africa have a lot of diversity for different sauropodomorphs. So it's very likely that's kind of where they got themselves going. This also tracks throughout the Middle Jurassic, where there's Codosaurus and Barapasaurus, which are non-neosauropod sauropods. So what that means is they're really closely related to most sauropods, but rather than being in the group with things like Brachiosaurus, they're instead probably closer to things like the Mementosaurus, which evolved mostly in China based on the fossils that we have. So just a really good indication that, yeah, India was pretty good for a lot of this evolution for many early sauropod groups. And then once they got to their different locations, they diversified even more. But the early Jurassic wasn't only for things like sauropods, there were also the first lizards starting to diversify there. And this fossil-informed analysis helps to suggest that this mostly happened in Europe and other parts of Eurasia. Europe has the better fossil record for this because there were a number of good Lagerstadt in that region that preserved more complete fossils of these lizards. However, again, really good indicator that this is where squamates lizards got their start, which is not what you would think of when you think of places with lots of reptile diversity today. But even in parts of Europe in the early Jurassic, there weren't just lizards, there were also dinosaurs. And some of the old fossils of them just kind of all got lumped with Megalosaurus, and that means some people have needed to go back and look at some of them. And that includes one from the early Jurassic that's been newly named Dornraptor. Now it's not super, super complete, but it was able to be found as an Avarostran theropod. This is most theropods, and it really helps to show just how diverse the early theropods were actually getting, forming into what would have largely been their later, more derived groups very early on. And by that I mean Dornraptor could potentially be closely related to things like the Carnosaurs, or the Allosaur-type dinosaurs, or even the Abelosaurs, which we do have some early fossils of some of their relatives from the early Jurassic of Italy. So, Really good indication that these groups were becoming very diverse very quickly after the end of the Triassic and into the Jurassic. One of the places that's been great for some of this early theropod diversity, but a little bit later in the Jurassic, has been the Canyadone Asphalto Formation in Argentina. And that includes with things like Asphaltovenator, which whole video on, you can check it out. However, this is actually adding new diversity to what we already knew about this formation because there's a number of theropods already known in addition to Asphaltovenator, and that includes things like Pietnitskisaurus and also Eoabalosaurus. The new fossil is just a dentary bone, so a lower jaw, and it's not super informative to be able to go, hey look, it's named as a new species. However, it does seem really similar to Ceratosaurus from North America, which could get up to pretty large sizes, pushing again 10 meters. Seems really consistent that a lot of animals in this month are approaching that size. However, importantly, it's really closely related to that, not in the same continent, and helps add to this diversity of the large number of theropods that were evolving in the southern continents. And as for this next paper, I actually saw an entire talk on this subject at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting in Cincinnati by Dr. Maidman, who's the only author on this paper. And I do have one critique of it that I'll get to later, but it basically just looks at where different fossils occur within the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation is massive, it stretches from parts of Arizona all the way up into Canada. So 
you actually can expect to see some kind of a gradient there. And turns out when you look at different fossils, that is what happens. You see different fossils in different places and different species in different places. In fact, you can actually look at the two different species of Camarasaurus and see that they really didn't overlap, and neither did the species of Allosaurus. So it's really helping to suggest that there was some different environmental types within this formation, and that different animals were sectioned off into different parts of it just based on habitat preferences. Now for my critique, they didn't really look at anything from Arizona in the Morrison Formation, but also that's not her fault. I mean, Arizona Morrison Formation has been very poorly sampled, and hopefully someone will get out there and find some good fossils. As for other gradients, there's generally a size gradient in many animals today, by which I mean elk down here in Arizona are going to be smaller than ones in Alaska, because it's just colder in Alaska and larger animals are able to retain heat better. And that's called Bergman's rule, and it's generally thought of as a rule. Looking at fossils doesn't really seem to be the case, and that was based on the Prince Creek Formation and other late Cretaceous localities at lower latitudes. Now, a large part of this could just be because there's not enough data to actually say anything concrete. They could seemingly be within their own kind of error bars, but if those error bars are massive because we don't have a lot of samples, doesn't really matter that much. So hopefully we'll get some more samples and be able to prove this more concretely, and also potentially just means that, hey, because the Cretaceous, and especially the late Cretaceous, was a lot warmer than it is today, maybe they just didn't need to be that much bigger. And as for the early Cretaceous, it's actually a bit cooler than we would have thought, and that's based on new paleoclimate studies that show that. That setup also potentially shows how rough it would have been for different animals because of how drastically the climate changed, and that's because occasional episodes of volcanism would have actually warmed the planet to a notable degree. And so, sure, there would have likely been ice sheets on parts of Antarctica, which was about at the South Pole during the early Cretaceous, that also means that there would have been times where those ice sheets would have melted. And we have fossils from the late Cretaceous of dinosaurs. We know they've survived all of those glaciations, it's just a matter of how intense those glaciations were, and how well those warming periods actually reprieved them and allowed these animals to go out and prosper. As for other organisms in the late Cretaceous this time, we're going to be diving deep down into the oceans, and that's with bone-eating worms. Ocidax is still around today, and basically they're only found around large animals that live in the oceans and die and sink down to the bottom and they're left as carcasses with bones, and then these worms can come in and eat those bones. So basically when whales die, they thrive. New fossils from the late Cretaceous of the UK, the US, and Belgium help to show that there was a lot of diversity in this group during the Mesozoic. And this is potentially just because the continents were still mostly spread out, but also there was a lot of diversity in different ocean life, with many mosasaurs and shallow seas throughout much of the, these continents that would have allowed a lot of diversity, and also meaning that a lot of these worms could have become diverse, targeting different groups. Maybe this one only fed on plesiosaurs. Maybe this one only fed on mosasaurs. And we can mostly just tell this based on different structures that exist in the bones of fossils that have sunk down to the bottom. And there does seem to be a lot of overlap, so it's hard to say that these different species were targeting specific animals that intensely, but it does help to show that, yeah, these organisms were around, they survived the KPG extinction despite the fact that many, many, many of these groups that lived in the oceans would have died out. And while they're probably not as diverse today, because a lot of them probably did die off during the KPG impact, those that made it through were able to find a new home in whale bones. And as for other odd animals in the oceans, and also in fresh water, we have the saber-toothed salmon, and this paper looked at some of those fossils a little better and found, hey, it's actually not saber-toothed, it's kind of like tusked, it has like sideways pointing uh, uh, teeth. That, that would have not made it a saber-toothed salmon. That said, it would have still been six feet long or so, or around two meters, so massive fish, again, coming up rivers and whatnot in North America, and now it's extinct, which is unfortunate, it would have been really neat to see one of those. As for actual saber-toothed animals, we have Barbarophilus, which is almost a cat, and Smilodon, which was a cat, and a saber-toothed cat at that. They had slightly different skull morphologies, and this paper used finite element analysis to see where the stresses would have been. What it found is Barbarophilus' skull overall would have been more robust and able to take different stresses. That said, Smilodon would have been able to spread those stresses out across the skull more evenly. This also means potentially that we can understand that they probably had different feeding strategies, or at least a different kill method. That's because Smilodon, while it's spreading those forces more evenly, also could take more forces on its teeth, meaning potentially its teeth were doing more damage or at least experiencing higher stresses. 
Meanwhile, Barbophilus had thinner and longer teeth that would have experienced more stress. However, with the skull able to impact those stresses even more and handle those stresses more, essentially the teeth may have actually just been absorbing that stress directly into the skull so that it could do whatever it was doing with its particular kill method. Again, it's really hard to know for sure. We don't have a good analog today to really understand this, and hopefully we'll get some better methods to try and understand this better, but it's at least showing that, hey, we can't just go, they all fed in this one way and killed their prey in this one way. It seems like there was a lot of diversity in what they actually did. As for more stuff on teeth, we're jumping back to the Cretaceous with the baby hadrosaur dinosaur. CT scanning of this juvenile specimen have been able to show kind of how the transition happened from their early tooth morphology into their adult tooth morphology. And that's because early on they seemingly had mostly cusp-based tooth morphology and occlusion. Occlusion just being where the two teeth come together and form a grinding surface. And cup-based means basically, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just two cups coming straight together and, and running into each other. It's pretty straightforward. Meanwhile, when you look at adult hadrosaurs, they had dental batteries of many, many teeth stacked on top of one another and chewed in such a way that they essentially sheared plant material on a flat surface. This one is kind of in the middle, helping show how that kind of change happened in ontogeny, essentially as the organism changed throughout its lifetime. Unfortunately for this one, it died before it became an adult, but it is really useful for us to understanding how these kinds of evolutionary changes and lifestyle changes would have happened in an organism's life. Also, it's really hard to know exactly which organism this was, because it's a juvenile, it's missing a lot of the more identifiable characteristics of the adults. However, based on what else was around and the different groups had your source, it was probably a young Gryposaurus. Titanomachia Jimenezi is a new titanosaur coming from Argentina, and it's really interesting because unlike many of the other Patagonian titanosaurs, it was not a massive giant like Argentinosaurus. Instead, it probably weighed about as much as an elephant, so it helps to show that titanosaurs were doing all kinds of weird and different things with their body styles, and it does seem like this organism was an adult. So really interesting to see that there were even very small titanosaurs, or at least relatively small titanosaurs when you consider the very massive ones. So really interesting to see just how diverse they became. There's also another paper that looks at just kind of what all was there in northeastern Brazil, and especially during the Cretaceous for its dinosaurs. Now, they did find there were a number of different sauropods and theropods, and I'm just going to say, hey, look at this image. The top is essentially beforehand in the early parts of the Cretaceous for this environment, and you can see the kind of diversity that's there with some of these different organisms. And then you can see on the bottom when the ocean actually started to intrude into this area. And it did this a few times, the sea level would rise and fall, then rise and fall, but it seems fairly consistent that this is the kind of ecosystem that you would expect to see during the later part of what was happening in the Cretaceous in this part of Brazil. Staying in the Cretaceous and looking at Erectodromines. Erectodromines are an interesting group of Ornithischian dinosaurs that have been suggested to potentially be burrowing. Erectodromius is one of the best known of these, and this paper actually did more work on it to try and understand its morphology a little bit more. And in addition to many other traits that I've talked about, I even have a separate video on one of these organisms that talks about some of those traits, they were able to find that it actually had really interesting femur placement. And by that I mean the femoral head is actually longer than what you see in other dinosaurs. What that means is it could probably slightly sprawl. Based on modern mammals that burrow, it seems very likely that this is a very similar adaptation. Essentially, this sprawling would help to make the body more rigid while using the forearms to dig. That would then help stabilize everything so it could dig more efficiently, and etc, etc. Yeah, it seems really likely that these organisms were burrowing. But on top of that, they found that it probably was pretty adept at it. And that's because the tail would have been more flexible than what we see in other Ornithischians. What this means is these burrows probably had more than one entrance. And that essentially just means that, hey, they needed to turn around or change direction well in these burrows sometimes. And having a more flexible tail helped to facilitate that. Jingia dongjinensis was named just a few months ago. And this paper really isn't that long because it's basically just going, hey, Jingia is already a genus of moth, so we can't use it for this dinosaur. Because of that, they've now renamed it in just to be more consistent and more in line with international naming standards. So now it's Jingiella dongjinensis. Very minor footnote, but you know, people gotta be thorough about their research. Ashkoceratops was described as the first ceratopsian from Europe, and it comes from Hungary, so barely into Europe, but still European. And it's really interesting that ceratopsians seem to have been so successful in parts of Asia and North America, but we've really not found any in Europe. So, hey look, we found one. Except it's really not that complete, it's just a beak. 
And based on this study, we really can't say anything about it. It could be any other kind of very strange dinosaur, we just don't know. Heck, there were even plant-eating theropods that had some really interesting skull morphologies. Look at some of the therizinosaurs, or even things like Dinochirus, for example. They were doing all kinds of weird things. So it's really hard to say for sure that this definitely was a Ceratopsian. It could be. Could be a lot of other things, too. Still in the Cretaceous, there's a ton of Cretaceous stuff, I know. We're going to be looking at trackways coming from China of what is potentially one of the largest Trudontids known. And I say trackways because we know it's probably a Trudontid, and because it's just tracks. Now the paper says it's a Dinonychosaur, which means it's closely related to things like Deinonychus, but also that just means that in the case of tracks, it has two toes because the innermost one would be lifted off the ground with the more, you know, the sickle claw of Velociraptor in Jurassic Park. That's all it is. And sure, Velociraptor wasn't that big, but this animal could have been. And that's based on the size of the foot being almost one foot long, so over one human foot long, like the, the imperial measure, which means it was pushing about 30 centimeters. Now, while Velociraptor wasn't as large as it was shown in that movie, this animal could have been. And that's based on the size of the foot, which would have been 36 centimeters long, or a bit over one foot in the imperial system. So, really large footed animal, and that means it was probably about as tall as I am at its hip. And then you'd have, you know, the rest of the animal standing there. So, just a tip. Just a tip. The rest of it. Huge dromaeosaur or trudontid, and based on the lengths of the different toe bones, and where those different joints are, probably trudontid. And now this one is not directly about the Cretaceous, although some organisms in this paper did live during the Cretaceous, it's instead about how we can try and be more concise about understanding dinosaur evolution, and especially theropod growth. And that's because this is basically a rewrite of a paper a little while ago, but with just more data. And this paper originally was going, hey, maybe some of these little compsognathids aren't actually compsognathids, but just juveniles of much larger theropod dinosaurs. And what they found is, hey, some of these probably are their own group that have traditionally been considered compsognathids. And that includes things like Cynoceropteryx. However, some of these earlier ones, especially those from the late Jurassic of Europe, things like Scipionyx, Scuriomimus, and Compsognathus, are found not to be at all closely related to those. Instead, they're found to be more closely related to megalosaurs, and this does make some sense. The megalosaurs really were common around Europe during the late Jurassic. Not to say it was all of megalosaurs, but they were just very common compared to other theropod groups. And that's really important because you can also look at things like Juravenator, which seemingly was closely related to the allosauroids rather than the megalosaurs. So again, you're getting some of these very small fossils of theropods, and when you're looking at them for more specific details and trying to pick out traits that are less likely to change throughout an organism's lifetime, for example, the number of teeth on the premaxilla, one of the bones in the skull, yeah, it makes sense that potentially these are just juveniles of much larger organisms. And as for this paper, I actually already talked about it a little bit when it was a preprint, but essentially just going, hey, remember that paper from January of 2023 that said T-Rex was as smart as a baboon? Yeah, it probably wasn't. Now this team of researchers is full of very smart and well-experienced paleontologists, and some new upstarts who are very good with brain stuff, and so it's really good to see this and just how thoroughly it was done. They do a ton of data and a lot of math and are able to compare different brain sizes and go, hey, you can't just take a mammal brain and scale it up to try and estimate how intelligent a dinosaur would have been. You also can't just do that with a bird, because as much as Tyrannosaurus rex was a Silurosaur on the closer branch of theropods to birds, it doesn't necessarily make it a bird. And so what they found instead is it's more likely that Tyrannosaurus rex was probably about as smart as a very smart crocodilian. The thing is, people have been underestimating crocodilians for years. Sometimes they even use tools in order to catch birds. So they're very intelligent, and potentially Tyrannosaurus rex was using some level of tools. You know, maybe it was trying to use a log to try and tip over an ankylosaur or something if it needed to. But it's really hard to show that, and I would also say it's not entirely likely, but it is possible. But of course, all of those non-bird dinosaurs went extinct, and what that means is we should study extinctions more, and that's what this paper is doing, but with the Permian-Triassic extinction, which is the worst extinction on history, 95% of life in the oceans died, and my wife's gonna go, oh gosh, I hear this again, because I talk about it a lot, I think it's a very interesting subject. 
This paper was using a fossilized birth death model in order to understand the faunal turnover that happened during the middle Permian though. So not the end Permian, just the middle Permian. And that's because there is this massive faunal change from things like Adaphrosaurus and Dimetrodon into the Pariasaurus and things like the Gorgonopsids, which are just different kinds of predators and herbivores respectively. Based on other models and the growing body of evidence of this kind of mid Permian extinction, they were able to suggest that, yeah, actually these fossilized birth death models do work, but also they could be refined. And the main part of the refinement that would be useful is more stratigraphic data. Essentially, where within the Permian do different organisms start being found and stop being found? Because with that, you can estimate the actual date of their extinction better and help to refine this model to make it better. Is it perfect? No, no model is perfect. But some models are useful and it seems like these ones are useful. As for extinctions closer to the modern day, we have the quaternary megafauna extinctions, which, you know, think of giant ground sloths and mammoths and giant rhinos and things. And what they were doing is looking at how different ecosystems changed with those extinctions. And what they found is it would have been less forested early on. And that's because these large organisms would have been knocking over or feeding on large trees and making the environment more open. Meanwhile, after they went extinct, you can see that the forests closed over and that it's not quite as much of a grassland in many areas. This also seems to really coincide with when humans were starting to enter many of these different environments, so it probably is people's fault is at least some of the conclusions here, and that tracks even with Africa. Africa is really interesting when you're considering the human element in it, and that's because humans evolved alongside all those megafauna. So for example, African elephants, they know what people are. They know to avoid people. Meanwhile, when you're looking at things like mammoths in North America, when humans migrated in after they were there, they were less prepared for that kind of change in their environment. So Africa has actually been a little bit buffered from this because of that coevolution. Of course, then as humans develop things like guns and just kind of wantonly ruined the environment, you've been starting to see some of those changes still occurring in Africa, unfortunately. As for some of the strange megafauna, you have the stenuring kangaroos, or the short-faced kangaroos, that also had binocular vision so they could stare straight at you. They're kind of unsettling if you think about it. This paper was essentially just looking at how they actually developed this kind of a very short face. And what they found is based on the young, yeah, they're built basically like kangaroos, and then allometry basically explains the entire development of the short face. Not necessarily why it happened, but how it happened. Allometry is when different parts of the body grow at different speeds. And so essentially it's just, hey, yeah, it had a face very similar to most other kangaroos, and then the front part of it just didn't grow as much. Pretty straightforward method for that kind of occurrence to happen. Still not known exactly why they had those short faces, but at least we have a kind of biologic reason for it to occur. As for older mammals, we're jumping back to the late Cretaceous again. I know, crazy, lots of Cretaceous stuff. However, this is looking at one of the mammals that is very early on and helps to show some very unique morphologies. Zellum delestes is from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, and its neck had a very interesting feature on the second vertebra, and that's this very long spinous process. It was also able to be shown that it could bend its neck up very far and down very far. What this means is it was probably trying to eat a lot of worms or other things living under the sand. Essentially, it could dig in, grab at them, and then pull very hard at them in order to have them not escape. That said, the spinous process also was for anchoring muscles onto the back of its neck, and this is really interesting, because the Gobi Desert is where you find a lot of small theropods that were probably eating small mammals. For example, you can think of things like the true Velociraptor, which is about the size of a coyote. Interestingly though, this kind of feature is probably similar to what we see in Tenrex, where some Tenrex can actually pull up large spines on their back so they're less likely to get eaten. And that means Zambalodestes probably had this exact same kind of trait where it could pull up spines and try and not get eaten. And still in mammals, but this time jumping all the way to the Miocene, we have something that was fairly close to humans. By fairly close, I mean it's actually probably closer to all great apes. Or at least that's what it was thought. Pliobates is a fossil primate from Spain, and it's generally been thought of as very close to the hominoids. Hominoids are essentially all great apes, and so it's, look, we have this sister group to the great apes. This paper did a lot more work on it and other fossil primates and found, yeah, that's not the case. And you can see that in this graph here where they kind of change up the phylogeny. The red is the older idea with it very close to humans and the other great apes. However, the blue part is the results from this study. The moral of the story is partial fossils, even with very unique traits, can be just convergently evolved and that can make things like primate evolution very difficult to understand. What this means is essentially, hey, sure, this fossil may have some very interesting and unique traits that we think places it somewhere, 
but you can't ever really rule out convergent evolution. And potentially as we look at more traits from these organisms, we might find it more likely that it's not actually that closely related to them. And staying in primates, and specifically humans, although this time Neanderthal fossils, we have a Neanderthal jaw in marble, where essentially this person went to their parents' house and went, hey, I'm a dentist, and that is a human jawbone. Now, obviously, different research was able to show, hey, this is from the time that Neanderthals were in Europe and Homo sapiens wasn't yet in Europe. So we can go, yeah, it's a Neanderthal. They were probably living around some kind of karstic system, meaning a cave where essentially limestone was dissolved and they could get in. Then more limestone essentially just kept precipitating there and this person got buried and now they're a fossil. That got chopped in half to make limestone flooring. <laughs> this also means that there's potentially an entire rest of the body spread out across a hundred other people's houses. You know, just, oh look, you have a tibia. Ah, you have a rib. It's really interesting to think about and it's unfortunate that, you know, this is the only part of the fossil we have, but you could find something similar like this somewhere else. And moving on to more things with people, West Virginia is opening the bills to try and start teaching intelligent design, or at least allow the teaching of intelligent design, which isn't really the most scientifically accurate way of trying to teach evolution, which is why a lot of researchers are going, hey, that's kind of a bad idea. We're just gonna keep messing with people and not actually getting them to understand how evolution works and the actual consequences of things like climate change, because, oh, hey, no, don't worry about it. It's just all made anyway. It just snapped into existence. And finally, papers that we have entire separate videos on, the first being Ichthyotitan, a giant ichthyosaur coming from the UK. Just its syringular bone in the skull is over two meters long, so taller than I am. Absolutely massive animal, potentially reaching 25 meters in length or over 80 feet. This would make it rival some of the largest animals around today. And it's not exactly known what it was doing. Unfortunately, that jawbone doesn't show if it had teeth or not. And it'd be nice to know, but hey, you take what you can get. And then there's Vasuki, another giant, but this time a snake coming from the Eocene of India. And it was very large, potentially larger than Titanoboa. It's really hard to get mass and size estimates on snakes because they're very often very incomplete. And that's the case here. There are some vertebrae that are articulated, which just means, hey, they're basically in life position, but there's not the whole skeleton. So estimates push it at around 30 feet on the minimum end and potentially up to 40 or 45 feet on the larger end. So between 10 and about 13 or 14 meters. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. That was a lot of recording. We're trying to catch up. We got a lot going on. Submitted abstracts at Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. So with any luck, you'll see me presenting research there. If not, you never heard this. Check out our Patreon to help us keep this thing running. All that said though, I guess, yeah, just be safe, take care. Don't go extinct.